Hi everybody, uh, I am uh, Trey, one of your average film enjoyers, and I am here to tell you that you can win over $500 worth of movie stuff. So if you're listening to this podcast, you're a huge movie fan. Obviously, you wouldn't be listening if you didn't love film like me and Jagger. Um, and so me and Jagger, along with, uh, three other content creators on TikTok, uh, Film Gunch, who we've had on here, uh, Wes, who we've had on here a couple times, and then, uh, one of our good friends, Real Takes, we are all, uh, joined together doing a giveaway currently, and it, um, how you join this giveaway is you go, uh, to each of our pages, we all have the giveaway video pinned. And you'll go on to that video. You'll give us all a follow. We uh, Each account is tagged in every video. Um, and then com comment down below. Uh, five Tag five of your friends. And if you tag five different friends in all five different videos, then you can get up to 30 entries. 30 entries. You can get up to 30 entries. So, uh, but you're like, Trey... Well, you're telling me about this, but I don't even know what I can win. Well, I'll tell you what you can win. Uh, Real Takes is donating a uh, 4K Harry Potter collection, Blu-ray James Bond collection, uh, I believe a 4K uh, collection of the Planet of the Apes films, and uh, the first three John Wick movies in 4K. Um, I'm donating three criterions of your choice, so whoever wins get to choose uh, three criterions. And we'll mail those to you. Uh, Jagger, my co-host, is donating um, three or a bunch of international DVDs. Um, Gunch is donating um, uh, uh, Don Hertzfeld and uh, oh, I can't remember the other guy's name. Well, the animated show. It's a very limited edition animated sketch comedy show. He has a bunch of steel books of all three seasons, so he's donating those. And then the biggest one. Wes is donating a region-free Blu-ray player. So if any of those items interest you, again, go to any of our TikTok pages. Go to me and Jagger's TikTok page. Try the film noob, Jagger Film Reviews. We have the video videos pinned on top of our pages. So go check them out. Follow the instructions. Uh, the giveaway ends when we are all five of us at a thousand followers and me and Jagger are the only ones that haven't hit a thousand followers yet. So please help us get a, uh, get us there so we can give away all this movie merchandise. Now let's get to the podcast. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Average Film Enjoyer. We are your average film enjoyers, Jagger and Trey. And today we are joined by a very, very special guest, my father, Levi Arzi. Uh, Dad, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing great. I'm super excited to be on with you guys. Um I've listened uh, to a lot of your um, Hooptober episodes recently. Um, I don't have any major bones to pick, but, uh, but yeah, I'm just excited to get it on. Yeah. Um, so usually something we like to do with our guests so the listeners can kind of get to know like what kind of movies they like, what they're into, is go through their letterbox top four. Obviously, you don't have a letterbox, but I think you do have like a kind of top four prepared that you want to talk about. Yeah. So why don't you go ahead with those? Okay. Um, for uh, top four and they, they kind of rotate uh, and they move and change places. And yeah. Uh, but they've been my four for a while. Um, so uh, whiplash um, would be one drive would be two. They flip flop back and forth. Yeah. Um, Field of dreams would be three. Uh, and then Daddy's Home 2 is number four. Wow, that's a switch from what I'm I kidding. asked earlier. <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, I'm kidding about Daddy's Home 2. Ghostbusters is number four. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, my favorite movies are usually just the ones that I can pick up at any time. Um, or 
you know, there might be a spot that I, that I catch it on TV and I'm like, Oh, I got to wait for this part or I gotta, I gotta wait until this happens. Um, yeah. And so for those, those are ones that I can just watch at any time and any mood, any time of year. Um, I could watch any of those movies. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think that's a huge misconception for some people in the film community where like, they're like, Oh, if you're a, like a movie buff or a cinephile, like your favorite movies are like citizen Kane or gone with the wind or yeah. the Godfather. Not particularly. Yeah. Like, it's just yeah. like whatever you enjoy, you know? And, um, uh, I, that's a great top four. I mean, I've seen all of those. Uh, I know Jagger's a huge Bill Murray guy. Um, yeah. so yeah. Uh, so we're going to start off today how we usually start our IMDb episodes. We are going to get into our movie trailers. Um, so first one, uh, we got a new trailer for Wonka this week starring Timothy Chalamet. Um, looks like it'll be one of our many December releases this year. Um, uh, I'll just, just start off. Dad, what are your thoughts about this? What are your thoughts about this new Wonka film? And on here, you don't have to like... You don't have to be like, oh, it looks so good. Like, you can say whatever you want. I, okay, so I just watched, I caught, like, the tail end of the first trailer, like, a week ago. I, I didn't know this movie existed. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just watched the second trailer. And had you, um, I I feel like Timothy Chalamet might be getting blackmailed to do this, to do this job. <laughs> um I think, I think this looks like a made-up movie. Um, I don't know who they're making it for. Um, it's almost like Timothy Chalamet got some like bad advice from Hugh Jackman, um, and uh, and it's just, I, it's it's baffling. It's baffling to me. Yeah. Um, and for somebody who's, I loved in Lady Bird. Um, I know he's been great in other things. Um, he uh it just like even the trailer just strikes the wrong tone with me yeah i, I don't understand it yeah actually. jagger what about you what are your thoughts on this new wonka film that we're getting in december you know you said um made me laugh because i feel the exact same way i don't know what this movie is being made for i think it's super unnecessary and I think that it honestly bothers me that they're taking a movie that is such a classic and it was already ruined with the Johnny Depp one that I myself didn't like. I think that we should have learned from that and just stopped. But again, this is Hollywood and it could make money. So I guess there's that. Um, I don't know. I don't understand it. Yeah, I feel like this has been a big topic of conversation on our IMDb episodes as of late about how hollywood likes they're they're more focused on the product and not like the con the quality of the content and original ips mm -hmm. and stuff how like miramax or lionsgate or whoever just bought the rights to michael myers to keep doing halloween movies and how we have this color purple remake coming out which n nobody really asked for i mean the first one is amazing and nobody mm -hmm. really asked for this new one um, I am cautiously hopeful though. I think it, it's very colorful. Uh, Ro Rome, oh, what's his name? Mr. Bean, Roman Atkins. Is that his name? Um, yeah, yeah sure. he's in it and I'm always down, uh, for anything with him. Um, so I'm cautiously hopeful. Like I understand where you guys are coming from, but it looks, the it looks just like a fun time. So, but we'll see, you know? Um, next trailer, second trailer I want to talk about is Pain Hustlers, the new, um, drama starring Chris Evans and Emily Blunt about the opioid crisis. Um, Jagger, I'm going to kick it to you first. What are your thoughts about this one? Okay, here's the thing. Um, we talked about this on a pretty recent episode. Uh, it might have actually been our last episode of the taking something that affected a lot of people and making a movie about it yeah there are grapes mm. of wrath episode we talked about that yeah i think that this is kind of doing that if that mm -hmm. makes any sense 
Yeah. Um, and I don't know. I feel like this is one that in order to say absolutely anything about it, we have to wait for it to come out and see how tasteful it is and then see after that, based on how they tackle it, then I'll make an opinion on it. Yeah, for sure. Um, Dad, what about you? Do you, do you have any... Uh, because I know you just watched like the this and Ferrari. Mm. Uh, so do you have yeah. any like like instant thoughts about this trailer? Yeah, first off, I need to apologize to Emily Blunt. Um, I know she's listening. So, um, <laughs> Emily, I'm sorry. When we were walking out of Oppenheimer, I was so excited during the whole movie um, <laughs> that I was going to get a Rooney Mara renaissance. I swore, I swore that was Rooney Mara. I didn't know that it was Emily Blunt. <laughs> So we're walking out of the movie and we're all talking about it, the whole family. And I'm like, and I'm so, I'm so excited that Rudy Mara's back. And uh, and they're like, well, what part did she play? And I was like, it was Oppenheimer's wife. And everyone was like, that was Emily Blunt. And so now every time I see her, I just think about Rudy Mara and how much I want Rudy Mara to be in more movies. Um, yeah, I mean, it looks good, but I know it's going to feel like the big short where it's like fun and funny but also sad and um, depressing. And it also feels like something that we're still in the middle of, like as a country and as a people. So um, yeah, I'm cautiously, yeah. I, 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 I don't know that I'd see that in the theater, um, but it does, it, it looks good. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, um, oh, Jagger, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, if you didn't have any other trailers, I found one that I don't know if you guys had seen. I, would, um, I think we were going to looks... do Ferrari, but then... Or what's the one that you were going to... Oh, did you hear that they're doing another, like, four-episode thing for American Horror Story? Yeah, I've been this? seeing that all over the internet. Um, I think it looks fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. It looks creepy. I mean, I feel like... Dad, I know you haven't seen this, so but and mm -hmm. you never really watched any American Horror Story, but I, I from the stuff I've watched of them, I've had a good time, and this new season looks fun. Um, I don't know about you, Jagger, what your thoughts are on it. Yeah, I think it looks cool. I think that that's about where it ends, though. Yeah, it could be good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then last trailer that I wanted to touch on was we finally. London Film Festival finally ended. A bunch of premieres happened at that. So we've gotten a bunch of new trailers. The one I'm most excited for is we finally got our first look into Michael Mann's Ferrari. Starring Adam Driver and Penelope Cruz and Shailene Woodley. Um, and Dad, I'm going to kick it to you first. Uh, what are your thoughts about this? Um, yeah, um, huge Adam Driver fan. Love Michael Mann didn't know this movie was going to come out um what a trailer um it was like even the even the sound design like in the trailer was amazing yeah uh so i can't i, I really i just cannot wait to see this in a movie theater um i don't know if it's going to be good uh but i know it's going to look and sound cool so yeah agreed jagger what about you uh I think that you kind of hit the nail on the head. The sound design is crazy. Uh, so much was being thrown at you in the trailer alone that I am extremely excited. I love Michael Mann. I think he has a lot of great movies. Um, Trey, I know you don't like it as much as I do, but I love Heat. Uh, mm. So I feel like this movie has a lot of potential if yeah. he goes down like a dramatic route which it seems like he is going to and i think that this has the chance to be like an amazing like imax epic so for sure I'm here for that yeah the movie that came to my mind while watching the trailer like comparing it to was uh ford v ferrari which we got i believe that was 2021 um it's either 2020 or 2021 um but that movie had just epic sound design, epic visuals, and it, it had a very similar feel to this trailer. So I'm I'm much looking forward uh, to this personally. But I am going in cautiously because, as Jagger said, I'm not the biggest fan of Michael Mann. 
Um, I thought it was just Heat that I didn't really like, but then I've tried some of his other stuff like Collateral, and I'm like, okay, I just, I'm not a huge fan of the way he makes movies. Um, but I think this one looks really interesting and really cool. Um, so those are, uh, oh yeah, Jagger, we already talked about American Horror Story. Um, yeah, those are our movie trailers for today. Um, hopefully we get some good ones that coming out this week that we can talk about next week. Um, now on to right before we get into our review, we're going to do our movie headlines, movie news, give our thoughts about that. Um, so Barry Levinson, who is director of Good Morning Vietnam, uh, and Rain Man, um, is set to direct a new action thriller with Al Pacino, um, about, uh, the JFK assassination. Um, and I was just wondering, what are your guys' thoughts, instant thoughts about, I try to keep the movie news to myself so we can get your instant thoughts about that. Dad, I see you had a stronger facial expression when I said that. Um, what do you, what do you think about this? Um, I have a, I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions. Uh, I, it sounds like you just, like you did like a movie Mad Lib and you just made all of that up. So yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna have to Google it. Yeah, Jagger, what about you? Do you have any instant thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I'm also gonna have to Google that. Um, <laughs> can you? All right. Well, I'll move us on to the next one. And if you guys want to Google that, um, right, can can you quickly tell me what that is again? I don't know if I heard you right. Uh, a Barry Levinson, um, Al Pacino starring action thriller oh. about the. Yeah, you buried the lead, too, because he's going to be directing it, and David Mamet wrote the script. Remind me of what else he's worked on. Uh, Well, David Mamet wrote and directed The Spanish Prisoner, um, State in Maine, which is a really, really great movie about the movie industry, and um, particularly shooting a movie in a small town in Maine. Um, But uh, he's most famous for writing the play Glengarry Glen Ross uh, ah. that was turned into a movie um, starring Al Pacino and um, but, uh, Alec Baldwin. I, I was going to say Bob Lemon, Jack Lemon, um, Alec Baldwin's in it. Yeah, Kevin Spacey. Yeah. Okay. Wait, I'm... Al Pacino. Al Pacino's doing another movie this year, directed by Michael Keaton. No, I didn't see this. What's that? Hold on a second. Knox Goes Away is a 2023 American neo-noir film thriller directed by Michael Keaton and written by Gregory Poirier. It stars Keaton, Al Pacino, Marissa, uh, Marcia Gay Harden. I haven't heard of any of these other people. Um, it premiered at TIFF on September 10th. Hmm. Critical response... 50% on Rotten Tomatoes and 5.4 on IMDb. Oh, so very so it's not middle doing of the road. Well. Whoa. Yeah. 5.4 on IMDb is basically like a negative 10 anywhere else. Yeah. I feel like everything yeah. on IMDb is like 7.2. I've, yeah. I never <laughs> see anything past, like, it's always like 7.7. Like, Godfather 2, it's a 7.9. It's like, what? So if you use a 5.4 on IMDb, you're it's hot garbage. Yeah. Um, this is one I'm very excited for. So Matthew Vaughn, who uh, directed the first two Kingsman movies, um, mm. he's directing the new Henry Cavill one, which also stars uh, Bryce Dallas Howard. Uh, Argyle, he uh, directed uh, X-Men First Class, which was the X-Men reboot. Um, super talented guy, one of my personal favorite directors, as far as action goes, um, said he would like to reboot Star Wars. Um, and he thinks it's time to, like, go back to the beginning and reboot it. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Jagger, I know you're a big Star Wars guy. What are your thoughts about this? God. Um, they never stop with movies huh yeah i mean the last star wars movie was hot garbage i didn't like any of the prequels i don't see any reason to reboot this i think we had a great starter three um the second to last one was good um 
and all of the other ones were either totally fine or unbearable to sit through, and I see no reason to continue. I think it's fine where it is. It's over. If you want to keep doing these shows, I'm fine with that. The Disney Plus shows, not all great, but, I mean, mm-hmm. who's going to stop them? They have a lot of money. So, there's no one stopping them. So, I guess, let them do that. No need to bring them back for more movies, though. Dad, what about you? I know you're a big fan. Or not a big fan, but you're a fan of some of the Star Wars films. Yeah, I... um. I would be interested in a new take. I kind of feel like it's just so precious at this point, but then they have like so much, um, they have so many different projects going uh, that, uh, yeah, I I would love to see a new take or a darker, something darker or um, doesn't take itself so seriously. Yeah, uh, that's why I enjoyed uh, whatever the one Ryan Johnson directed. The second, Last Jedi. Uh, yeah, Jagger. Yeah, we have Jedi. another Last Jedi lover on here. Yeah, I, I, that was exactly what I wanted Star Wars to be. Yeah. Um, until I thought they were going to kill Chewbacca, and I was like so excited. I think that no, that was a uh, Rise of that was Rise of Skywalker. I know, I know. Sorry, I said that weird, but. The Ryan Johnson one was what I wanted Star Wars to be. Mm-hmm. And then when I started watching the last one uh, with What's-His-Face. Um, Palpatine. Um, yeah. Like, I got excited because I thought they were going to just kill everyone off. And then it was like, oh, no, there was a second ship. And that that's when I was fully fully out in the whole Star Wars universe. Yeah. Or but, yeah, I think it would be. I think it'd be an interesting. I really enjoyed Kingsman. I've only seen the first one. Yeah. Um, but I would love to see a Star Wars scene similar to that. You know, Colin Firth in a church, just uh, with a lightsaber. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm a huge fan of the King. I f- the Kingsman movies. I think they have really, really fun choreographed and cinematography like action sequences like the church scene or i mean really any of the fight scenes in those films is matthew vaughn does an outstanding job and as far as reboots go he did a great job with x-men first class like we had these original x-men first one came out in 99 2000 and then um he came out with first class i think that's a great superhero film I don't have it logged, but I see that being like a four, four and a half for myself. Um, and oh, he, also, he also directed Layer Cake and Kick-Ass, so he's good. Yeah, Matthew he's, Vaughn oh, yeah. is super versatile. I really like him. Um, and I think one thing that could make this better is uh, if he got John Favreau on board. Because I think all the Star Wars content we've gotten at post rise of skywalker that has been actually been been good has had john favreau as a part of it like the first season of mandalorian which i wasn't a huge fan of but i can respect and i can like look at it and be like yeah that's really well done and john favreau knows what he's doing so i think if we got some combination between them two i think that could really work um but yeah and then last headline before we get into our review of groundhog's day um We got a new trailer for Godzilla Minus One, which is our new, the new MonsterVerse uh, Apple TV Plus original. Um, And Jagger, I'm just wondering, and Dad, what are your thoughts about the expansion of this MonsterVerse universe? So like Godzilla, Kong, Skull Island, Godzilla vs. Kong, Mm -hmm. all that, all those kind of movies. What are your guys' thoughts about those? You don't have to have any either. You like, you can be like, I don't have any I, thoughts. Yeah, I I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Godzilla. I mean, unless he's showing up to eat uh, Willy Wonka, played by Timothy Chalamet, and then he does like <laughs> a little dance with Wonka's hat. Um, I, I'm out. Yeah, Jagger, are you in the same boat? Yeah. This is like, I I I could not care less about these new MonsterVerse movies. Yeah. Um. I don't understand Godzilla vs Kong. I've tried to watch it several times now, and I feel like 
they called it Godzilla vs. Kong just to get um, people in seats. Mm-hmm. And then put like five minutes of Godzilla fighting King Kong in it. And the rest of the movie is a pathetic attempt at just putting something on screen because they already got people to pay for it. So, yeah, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> well, and I, I will say to end on a positive note, uh, the Peter Jackson King Kong is awesome. I, I love that. Agreed. And it was like one of the first movies I saw in the theater where I felt sick to my stomach when he had uh, Naomi Watts up on the, when King Kong had Naomi Watts like up on the, um, up on the top of the building. Yeah. Um, like I really felt like I was like up there and I felt I hate heights anyway. Um, and then God, Godzilla 2000 starring Matthew Broderick uh, gave us the Puff Daddy, uh, Jimmy Page uh, matchup. <laughs> Uh, which also resulted, and you can't find it, but it resulted in one of the most bizarre uh, Saturday Night Live performances. Um, where I, I think that was P, yeah, it was P. Diddy, where they sampled Cashmere, but Jimmy Page actually played on it. That's um, pretty sweet. Yeah, it's it's like mind blowing if you ever get to ch- get get to see it. But yeah, personally, wasn't the guy from Leon the Professional in that one? Yes, Gene Reno. Yeah. Personally, Wait, is that his name, Gene? I Gene? think that sounds yeah, right. I think it is. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Um, for me personally, I'm super excited. I've talked about this multiple times on this pod, and I've talked about this multiple times to Jagger. How these movies are like my guilty pleasure movies. Like mm-hmm. I just have a ridiculously good time. Kong popping his shoulder back into place, and in Godzilla versus Kong where he pops his shoulder back into the place on the side of a skyscraper is like top 10 most hype moments I've <laughs> ever been. I remember it was like 2 a.m. and I was watching it in bed and he did it because he, they like, he like dies and Godzilla's fighting Mecha Godzilla and um, they get these, they basically shock um, uh, King Kong back to life with like, they make a giant makeshift defibrillator and he gets up and this like heavy rock music starts playing and he's oh, like no. all hyped up and his shoulder. So he just walks up to this building and just goes boom. And I was like, Oh shit. And it was, Oh, it was awesome. And the way God's King Kong fights in these movies, he like does like hand to hand combat. Like he was going up to Godzilla and like, gah, 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 gah. it was God. They're just so much fun. And we finally get, a casting that I've been waiting for. We get Kurt Russell and then in young as young Kurt Russell in flashbacks, Wyatt Russell. They got them both, father and son, playing the same character because dad, you were watching Big Trouble with Little Chi in Little China the other night, the John Carpenter uh action film, and we were both commenting on like, yeah, he looks exactly like Wyatt Russell. Yeah, and more so in The Thing, which I watched recently. I'm trying to watch a bunch of Carpenter movies, but um, he, they look, yeah. I mean, obviously they look alike. They're related, yeah. but um, yeah, like Kurt Russell in The Thing with his beard looks exactly like Wyatt Russell. Um, yeah. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. All right, well, that is movie news for today. Tune in next week for some more uh, movie news content. Um, if you're still listening with us, um, leave a like, comment down below what you think about some of the stuff we've talked about today. Subscribe to our channel, subscribe on Spotify. Um, but yeah, let's get into our movie review. So today we are checking off yet another movie on our IMDb Top 250 series, um, with, uh, the classic um harold ramus film groundhog day um so here's a synopsis for you guys a narcissistic tv weatherman along with his attractive but distant producer and mawkish cameraman is sent to report on groundhog day in the small town of punk satani where he finds himself repeating the same day over and over um, this movie has a 3.8 overall on Letterboxd. I believe an IMDb score of 8.1. Um, 
Starring Bill Murray, Andy McDowell, Chris Elliott, Stephen Tobolowski. Shout out to Stephen Tobolowski. Um, Brian Doyle Murray. Um, and uh, Rick Duckamon, who I, is an actor I have just learned about in a few films. And I am absolutely loving. Um, yeah. Uh, young Michael Shannon. Young Michael Shannon. Oh, yeah, I forgot it. I totally forgot about that. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a sec. But, um, yeah, so let's get into our review. Uh, Dad, since you're the guest, um, how we kind of do this is we, all three of us, give our opening thoughts, and then we kind of just go wherever the conversation takes us. Um, okay. So why don't you give us your opening thoughts about Groundhog Day? Well, I'll give you my opening thoughts as far as um, just overall how I like the film and what it was like watching it again. I haven't seen it in a few years. Okay, so if I had um, if I had to give it a five, you know, a, a rating between one and five stars, um, I give it four and a half. Um, I love this movie. Um, Bill Murray, watching him play, um, you know, this is kind of his first semi-serious role. Um, but up to this point, uh, I had just idolized him. Um, I mean, when this movie came out, I had already seen Ghostbusters roughly 57 times. Uh, and I had every single line memorized and just like the sarcastic, marmy, um, East Coaster attitude he had, um, was, uh, was amazing. And even in the first 15 minutes of this movie, you get so much of that. Um, and the, the, what really struck me about this, and then, I, and then I'll pass it off to you guys, is even in like that first 10 or 15 minutes, how natural of a weatherman he is. Like, he, that was like the most realistic part of the movie for me, was his weather report at the beginning. The way he moved through and like pushed things off and um, just his overall attitude. I grew up watching local news, so it, there's always the cheesy weatherman. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it just, like, thrilled me. But, yeah, I'd say four and a half. I really enjoyed it. I have a lot of thoughts. But I'll pass it off to you. Yeah. Jagger, why don't you go ahead, give us your star rating and your opening thoughts about this film. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> I feel kind of... <laughs> I feel kind of bad because if you love this movie so much, I could totally understand where you're coming from. <laughs> um, this movie is a classic. I understand that I am totally in a minority when it comes to not exactly loving this movie. Um, I didn't find it to be particularly funny. Um, then again, I have been known to be sort of picky when it comes to comedy movies because I have a sort of specific sense of humor so i could understand where you're coming from because this is a movie that is all around pretty lovable um it tackles some very obvious themes with like self-reflection and whatnot um and yeah i do appreciate this movie for what it is it definitely inspired a lot of movies to come after it the concept of reliving a day over and over has been stolen over and over um yeah. To a point that it is now a sort of dried out concept. However, this movie did really do it in a very unique and original way because it was very original at the time. Mm -hmm. I, however, gave this movie two and a half stars. Um, I didn't <laughs> love it, but... <laughs> That's still uh, not a negative review, though. That's not a negative review. It's not a negative review, but it's also not the most positive review you can give. Yeah. And that's the thing. I do appreciate a lot about this movie, but it's not a movie that I'm, like, urgent to come back to, if that makes any mm. sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And I think I'm, like, right in between you guys. I arrived... Dad, we finished this, and I was like, all right, no conversation... Because we watched this, like, two nights ago, and I was like, all right, no conversation and tell the pod. We have to save it. So I arrived... So, I don't know. My experience with this film is I was shown this by my dad, among a lot of other classics, um, it, like at, at a younger age. So I was shown, like, I grew up on Indiana Jones, Back to the Future, Ghostbusters, 
like the classics, you know, um, among like Disney movies and Marvel and stuff like that. Um, so, and I remember, I don't know how old I was when you showed me this dad. Um, but I remember like holding this movie super highly and thinking it was like genius when I was like 12, 13 years old. Um, I even Lily, Lily, my little sister, Lily loved this movie when we were young. Um, she thought it was so funny. Um, but upon rewatch, I, I think it's still, it's still good. It's still a super solid movie, but I do not hold it as highly as I did, um, in the past. Right. And because I think this is because I've had so much more and this, I find this happening a lot lately is I have so much more like experience and so many more films, um, under my belt that I, I look at things a different way when you've seen so much more, um, you know, and so it kind of like, I, I pick up on certain little things that sometimes don't rub me the right way. Um, and, uh, that I would have never picked up on before. Um, so I think I arrived at a three and a half for this film, a three and a half star, um, which is like, it's super solid. Um, I think it's very, it's a very easy watch. And they uh, they handle the obviously the deeper themes that Jagger touched on in a very like easy to digest way. Um, sometimes I think part of this film to kind of a fault, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but yeah, those are my opening thoughts. It's not like the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I think Bill Murray. It's not the best. Like in my opinion, it's not the best acting performance from Bill Murray. I think we get that in Lost mm -hmm. in Translation. Um, and it's not the funniest Bill Murray has ever been. I mean, I think you can agree with me, Dad. The funniest Bill Murray has ever been, I think we can all agree, is obviously Ghostbusters. Like, the mm -hmm. that movie will never not be funny for me. Um, but yeah, those are my opening thoughts. Um, Dad, you said you have a bunch of notes. Is there anything you want to start out and have a conversation about? Or, uh, what yeah, do you want to I, do? Uh, yeah, I've got... I've I've questions for you two, but for I sure. will save them. Um, I will save them. Um, and um, no, actually, let's get into them. At yeah. what point? At what Groundhog Day? Um, <laughs> you're you're in Phil Connor's shoes. Yeah, and you're reliving the same day over and over. Um, at what which Groundhog Day would you start jumping off buildings, stepping in front of buses? Um, would you get the courage to actually like step out and and try to either end your life or somebody else's life? For me, it's like day eleven hundred. Yeah. I gotta live like eleven hundred days before I trust it enough. Yeah. Because yeah. this movie, this movie gets dark. Like yeah. it gets super dark, um, and not just with the suicide, but with the old man, and how many times we don't even see how many times Phil's tried to save him. Mm -hmm. it, he could have he could have spent the whole day with that old man, um, two thousand times, twenty three hundred yeah. times. Like who knows? Um, and it always ends in heartbreak. You see when he's dying in the in the um, alleyway after he has all the soup and everything. Um, what that what that man means to Phil, um, and that it really stuck with me this time, like how dark, how dark it was, and how dark it could get. Um, mm -hmm. But that that would be my first question for you two. Like, when would you start exploring with your own mortality? How many days in a row would you have to experience? Jagger, so, why don't you take it first? All right, yeah. So my first thing that I was wondering was why he never took the opportunity to try and stay up through the whole night to see if he could witness the next day. Hmm. Um, I think he did try that. I think, and it, and it isn't explained really? that well when he's on the phone and it says 4 o'clock. I yeah. believe that's 4 a.m. He's in his pajamas. It's dark outside. He's, he breaks the pencil. Is that the same scene? Yeah, he breaks yeah, the pencil, puts so. it down there. Yeah. And then he's kind I mean, of staring at the staring at the clock. Um, I assume that it gets to 5.59, and then it just resets. Um, 
That would be my assumption. I'm sure. I'm sure right. he tried it. All right. Yeah. yeah. I feel. I feel like maybe you're right. Yeah. Um. I think that once you start to realize that it is actually a loop, and that you're actually stuck. Mm-hmm. I think first the dread sets in and the realization that there is no way out. And I think you take a few days to try and realize if that's the truth. And for me, at least, I would have already made the assumption that if you're in a loop, it doesn't matter as long as you're unconscious in one way or another, you're waking back up in this loop. Mm -hmm. um, the way I would have realized this was that like you said, um, other people do die around him, and then when he wakes back up, they're back. So I wouldn't even bother. I would start trying to find ways to break the loop before I worry about my own mortality. Because when mm. you realize other people's mortality is in this reset, then that's when I'd sort of just assume. <laughs> and I would say it's not worth it to waste my time. Um, and you're just wasting time when you could be trying to find ways out of the loop. Also, my other question. Assuming that he's the only one stuck in this loop, because no one around him realizes that the loop is ongoing, and they all question it the next day, and that's how he's able to keep doing these things where he acts like he knows everything about everyone, you know? And there was that whole bit where he was in the diner, like, this is this person, this is this person. I wonder what happens for the people not in the loop because they still have lives outside of the loop are that is everyone in their own individual truman show type loop mm. or are they just going on with their life and a different version of him is there like a multiverse type of thing or did he just one day disappear and he's stuck in this loop and no one else knows where he is and there are all of these excuses to keep him where he is in the loop just so that there's like something going on where yeah. he's unable to get out and that's just he's gone so i wonder what's happening whilst he's in the loop i was wondering if anyone else was thinking about that either and, of you. and, and you're not talking just about the people in punxsutawney but like in pittsburgh everywhere and yeah. in pittsburgh yeah 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 does he just up and disappear or is everyone in a loop what happened i think well, first of all, it would not take me that long before, um, and before like testing things out. Like, I think, I don't think, because obviously we see here, he wakes up one day and he's like, I'm done. And he drives yeah. into the, uh, quarry. I don't think I would just jump right to just like straight up killing myself. I think I would start testing it, like giving myself a cut on my hand before I went to sleep waking up to see if that cut was still there, testing stuff like that before I just jump right into killing myself. I mean, golly. Uh, but he and... does he does go get the toaster pretty early on, right? And drop it. Yeah, that's like the second bathroom. one. Mm -hmm. That's like 30 <laughs> that's, minutes into the movie. Yeah, it goes that's straight. That's like a week, a week into it, like the seventh day. He's like, I'm yeah. done, toaster. Poof. <laughs> I mean, um, we can't forget, we can't forget, he's a terrible human being. Like, oh, yeah. Phil, Con like, you know, I don't know, uh, dad probably left when he was young, mom was probably an alcoholic, um, he has no coping skills, he's very selfish, um, so what better person for this to happen to? Um, the thing that's interesting, I don't know, did you guys do any reading about, like, how the movie came about? um no the, uh, specifically danny rubin who who wrote the story he wrote a short story um well he wrote a script treatment and it was called 1201 and it was the idea of somebody living in the same loop um mm -hmm. and his agent had him um make it more uh marketable so they could send it to studios and directors and whatnot um and so the closest he wanted to do it around a holiday and the closest holiday when he was actually sitting there writing it was Groundhog Day. So he just made it Groundhog Day. But the first script, his original script before Harold Ramis uh, collaborated with him, was super dark. 
Yeah. Um, it was like the dark side of this lighthearted Frank Capra style movie. Um, and it, it really focused on a lot more of that where it was like death, homicide. Um, he spent um, a considerable amount of time seeing how far away he could get from Punxsutawney, um, either by plane, train, boat. Um, I think they touched on a little bit of that in Palm Springs, um, which again, shout out to people like the people who made Palm Springs because it's like it's so much different and explains it in a different way and like can like stand on its own. Um, because Groundhog Day is such a part of pop culture. Yeah. Um, I mean, if it was before this movie came out, if you would have said, this feels like Groundhog Day, people would be like, you sound like you're crazy. Like, what are you even talking about? But now, if you feel like you're living like the same day, you say it, it's now part of our lexicon. Like, it's part of our experience. Mm -hmm. um, that, like, and before this movie, that wasn't, that wasn't a thing. Um, and yeah. I don't even know that everyone knew about Punxsutawney and Gobbler's Knob, which I don't, uh, I remember being a teenage boy watching this movie and thinking Gobbler's Knob was like the dirtiest, funniest thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> like, I don't know, it just sounds so bad. Uh, I'm like, man, they should probably get a new name for that. But yeah, sorry, um, I threw a lot out there for you. No, I totally agree. Uh, that's part of the reason why I didn't rate it lower. That's part of the reason why my rating is where it is because of how iconic this type, like this is like at this point, it's whole own genre. Like we got stuff like Happy Death Day, Palm Springs you touched on. It's its own genre. And now, and it's literally called a Groundhog's Day type movie. So the, 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 like the iconic level of this film is a lot of the reason why, or it gave me like, okay, I need to at least bump it up a little bit uh, because of the how it affected mainstream culture. Um, and going, I had a thought, going back to your question about, like, when you would start testing morality. Um, I Something that I noticed that I never, I had never noticed while watching this before um, is, is you have, like, when, once he gets transferred into this Groundhog's Day and through some exposition that I didn't love, like from other outside characters that I don't feel like we needed, we learned that this is kind of like supposed to like make him realize how he's a terrible person and help him become a de better person, right? So, um, and so we get these, dip, I feel like very distinct stages of where he's at and what his main goal is by using this. So we get like the first stage, which is him using it to his own advantage and using it to serve him, to manipulate the others around him. Then we get to the point where, because we get that, that whole sequence where he's day after day after day trying to create that perfect night with Rita, Andy McDowell's character. And then... She figures out, like, what? You're a creep. Da, da 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 When he pulls out the ice cream off the window ledge. Um, and then he, like, gets super depressed. And we get this stage where he's trying to, like, end it. Right? And then we get this third stage where he's kind of in the middle. Like, he's kind of just going through the motions. Like, I don't know what to do. I'm stuck in this forever. Um, and then my favorite stage, we get this fourth stage where it's all about bettering himself. So we get him learning the piano, learning all these new skills. Um, we get him like trying to help as many people as he can. So it's this little, like they use these stages as like your view of the character arc from this self-centered asshole, essentially, to this more humane, um, humble person that we get at the end of the film. Um, and that's something that I picked up on. That was probably my favorite part is you get these four very distinct stages and yeah, it, you just get to watch him go through because I think these are the stages that we would all go through, like, or at least like it's the most realistic to go through. Um, and I just found that really interesting. And I'm wondering your guys' thoughts about that 
Jagger, I'll shoot it to you first. Or anything like my dad said. Any, Yeah, uh, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, I wanted to ask my own question, yeah. if I may. What? Can I, before and you do that, I... Jagger, can I just say say one thing? That yes. Trey, you sparked something in me, which was, um, remember the early days of COVID when yeah. you were like on lockdown? I yeah. think a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of people talked about Groundhog Day because it was just like get up. For me, it was like get up, don't work. Uh, watch, <laughs> watch an episode of uh, what was I watching? We were uh, watching Ozark. We're, or we were watching a uh, Cobra Kai. Yeah, we were watching Cobra Kai. Yeah, and it was like, I think I started COVID specifically quarantine with like, I'm gonna get a six pack. I'm gonna, you know, be able to do 20 pull ups by the time I'm done. I'm gonna, and it wasn't too far off before I was just like, I don't know, like Phil Connors, you know, two weeks in or whatever, and just yeah. lost hope and. Yeah, and motivation and just wants to eat and watch TV and um, yeah. yeah. So uh, sorry, sorry to cut you off there, Jagger. Go ahead. No, that's all good. I wanted to ask because I have my own opinion on it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if anyone else online has said it. They probably have. What do you guys think the loop means? Because I believe it has some kind of meaning like a metaphorical type thing and i wanted to hear if you guys like thought the same thing or what so without saying my opinion i want to know what you guys think it meant well i i try to base all of my thoughts or decisions off the uh the evidence that i have and i have no i really have no supporting evidence of why he was in a loop or what it means um And I thought that was one of the things, especially coming away from it this time, one of the things I really appreciated about it was it, there was no like, Hey, I'm in this loop and uh, I have to do uh, X in order for it to end, or I have to get true love's kiss or whatever, Um, you know, and you can draw your own conclusions from it um, or your own thoughts or feelings um, just about what the loop means and how he actually got out of it. Um, me, I think it's funny to think of it as just like a, a blip and maybe there's like somebody in California that was having like what you were talking about Jagger earlier, maybe somebody else was experiencing a time loop in like San Diego, um, on the same day. Um, and it was just like this weird, sequence of events and how the planets aligned or um yeah 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 i don't know um yeah i I think it's a great question jagger i mean i think i i we talked about this uh whatever our last episode was um when we broke down your short film um how i'm not the best at like picking up on the deeper themes of films and how you're like really good at it. Like you're a huge Lynch guy who always has deeper layered themes in his films. And, um, but I, I'm just like, I'm not great at that. I think really what the loop meant, I don't think it really meant anything. I think it was just, um, it was just a way to, I don't know. Maybe there's like a higher power that was like, I'm just going to, I don't know what that higher, it could be Buddha. It could be God. It could be, could be Zeus for all I know. Um, that was like, you know what, Phil Connors, you need to learn how to not be a asshole. So I'm going to put you in this loop and we'll see what happens. I don't know. That's, that's the first thing that came to my head. Um, but Jagger, I, I think you, it seems like you have a pretty distinct opinion on what it means so i would love to hear what your thoughts are so here was my take on it i thought that at the beginning they spend like half an hour making it very clear to you um that he's a bad person and this is like yeah this 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 in like one day they show of all of the horrible things he does over the span of a day and in my mind there's no actual loop but as a very closed-minded individual 
his life seems so close to a loop that for a movie they just obviously exaggerate it for entertainment purposes but that all it really means is that this is a man that is he doesn't do anything good for society and he's he just sucks so his life is so boring and closed minded that it's interpreted as a loop that he just does the same thing every day because he doesn't have people that like love him yeah he doesn't have anyone that's like mad to not spend a day with him so it's just a loop of the same thing every day for him and yeah. this is just their way of showing that and it's sort of like a metaphor if you will yeah i like that i like that dad uh do you have anything you uh, thoughts about that idea of this just being a big metaphor and an exaggeration uh, I love it. And uh, uh, what's interesting, if you read about, because um, this was actually the end of um, Harold Ramis and Bill Murray's friendship was making this movie. Um, they didn't speak after making this movie. They didn't speak to each other until right before Ramis. Uh, I think he was really sick and they got together and talked right before he died. Um, so much so that uh, Bill Murray wouldn't even talk about Harold Ramis um in interviews um and um but i will say bill murray wanted to spend more time on the philosophical side um and what the time loop means um spiritually or metaphysically um but you know it's a it's a pretty easy this was a family film um that couldn't really go deep on stuff like that um, but if you read up on it, Danny Rubin, uh, estimates that Phil spent, uh, 70 to 80 years in a time loop. Yeah. That's, that was going to be my next question is how long do we think he actually spent in this time loop? Because there's yeah. no really like, there's very few indicators. Actually, before I get into this, um, I I've always found that story the story about Ramus and uh Bill Murray really interesting. So I mean, is there anything you want to expand on about that? Like um Yeah, only only that I read that he uh, at that point um they had a lot of problems on the set um and I think it's uh, like not disputed at all. Um but then there was also this thought that um uh, Bill Murray felt that Harold Ramis got too much credit for making Bill Murray, um, whether it be, uh, you know, creating Ghostbusters, um, creating this movie, um, Stripes. Um, yeah. Caddyshack, uh, that he felt like he was the uh, lesser part of their, um, yeah, of their, of their partnership and um, that he wouldn't be Bill Murray without Harold Ramis. Uh, and so I think he was feeling, and he showed, he showed that he has acting chops. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we this was like the first movie that we saw that, um, that he could do the serious stuff. Um, but yeah, I think he was feeling that, um, from what I read, that, that Ramis was getting too much credit for, um, for creating Bill Murray. Hmm. That's interesting. For people who don't know, Harold Ramis, if you want to put a face to the name, is Egon in the Ghostbusters movies. Um, he also plays the neurologist in Groundhog Day. Oh, yeah. I always forget that he's in this. Um, yeah. He's also yeah. in the film. He plays Seth Rogen's dad in Knocked Up, um, which is something that I always forget. And then I watch Knocked Up and I'm like, hey, it's Harold Ramis. Um, yeah. Because it's always good to see him. He's a super talented guy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, oh, God. I had a thought before I went into this. Um, Jagger, I feel like we moved on from your from your, uh, from your your theory a little too quick. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think the thing 
for me is just that, you know, I'm trying to cover up until I can remember what you were talking about. Jagger, what were you talking about? I lost my train of thought. (laughs) Oh, the theory? Yeah. So my theory is that he's so, like, closed-minded that his life has become practically a loop. So... Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Sorry. Sometimes I got to do that where I forget what someone was talking about. So I I just pull words out of my ass until I can remember what they were talking about. And then I'll come up with a thought. Um, Yeah, I think that's a really interesting theory. The thing I would say to that is uh, is what you said to me after you asked me what... Dad, I still need to show you Jagger's short film. Um, The thing you said to me... After I said, I told you what my thoughts were on Serenity, um, your short film, is that is a lot smarter than I'm what I meant it to be, you know? Um, and uh, it's, I, I, I think it's a really beautiful thing that in a film like this, where it's 100% possible that was Harold Ramis's intention. That is that is exactly what he had in mind. But it's also possible that us having this conversation were like cre like this could be a theory. You know, this could be. I think this is what it means. Where Harold Ramis literally just wanted it to be a film about a guy who's stuck in a loop and him dealing with that. You know, and I think that's mm-hmm. really the really beautiful thing about film is you can get these deep, deep messages, even if they weren't intended to be there, you can get these deep messages, these deep themes out of these movies and talk about them. Um, especially when you love the movies so much, you know, and I think that's a really cool thing. Um, so I don't really know. I, I think it could, I think that could be Harold Ramis's, uh, intention. I think that's definitely possible. But I also think that it could just be like Harold Ramis being like, I want to make a movie about a guy in a time loop. And I don't really care about continuity or anything. I just want to make a movie about a guy in a time loop. Um, And I think that's a really interesting thing um, about film. Yeah. Well, uh, kind of on that thought too, Jagger, where you're, you know, somebody who's very close minded and, and really self obsessed. Uh, it's not till the end where he, you see that he has an effect on everyone in the town. And what stood out to me was by the end of the movie before it, like by the time he's like wrapping up his time loop, um, he has like personal relationships and everyone loves him like in the entire town, but that's still just one day. So there has to be some sort of message about, boy, I'm even like talking myself out of my own thoughts, but, um, but that idea of like there, the, each of those days and each of the days spent in the time loop had to have some sort of effect on the people that were around him. Um, because he couldn't just wake up at 6 AM and then by 8 PM, everyone in the town loved him because of the piano teacher and like, um, you know, the young couple getting married and like, there's no way he would have been able to fit all of that into a whole day. Like it, the time yeah. loop, the days spent in the time loop had to have meant something to the people of Punxsutawney. Yeah. You know, I've, I've never thought about that. I've never be, because as you bring that up, I've never thought about that. How, like, all this stuff where even though we get this sequence where he's just walking, knowing exactly where he needs to be at exactly the right time, where, like, he's just like, boom, catch the kid, boom, give the Heimlich to my brother, boom, light this lady's cigarette, you know? There's no way that he did that all in one day. So I've never thought about, that's really interesting, because I've, I've seen this movie three or four times, and I've never even thought about that. Um, Jagger, what what about you? you? Do you have any thoughts about that at all? Like the fact that what he was doing these days over and over and over again, um, like actually had an impact on these people. No, and I, I didn't think about that. However, now that you say it, 
Um, I could totally understand that. Um, and that's crazy to think about. Again, that even though it is a time loop, there's no way that all of these days aren't in somehow, some way connected. Which yeah. is, again, if I were to just go back to it and inflate my ego with my theory, that if this is not actually a loop, then the concept of them all being connected and him changing something just kind of adds to that theory that it's not really a loop. And I've already explained my theory now mm -hmm. more than once. But I think that if you do put the two pieces of what you're saying and what I had said together, mm -hmm. that it makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Shout out to the idiots watching Jeopardy, too, by the way. Those were, like, the easiest Jeopardy yeah. questions. Yeah, and they were like, <laughs> like oh, how does he oh, know? How do you know this? That was really funny. Um, shout out to Bill Murray's little, um, what b b b b b blizzard where he's talking to <laughs> yeah. the state trooper. Yeah. God, that makes yeah. me chuckle every time. Or don't uh, you... And the psychiatrist who I've only seen that guy as, uh, Julia Louise Dreyfus's husband in Veep, mm -hmm. uh, but he's super young. And the line reading where he is excited about having a... I have an alcoholic now. Yeah. Uh, was so <laughs> funny to me. It was so, so funny to me. Yeah. I, I have an alcoholic now. Like, he's, like, getting... <laughs> yeah. Getting established as a, as a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Trick, can I ask you if you also noticed that occasionally... And when you said the, um, the what blizzard part... He would occasionally, like, start to get, like, a green tint and start to look like he was dying. And then it would just go away in the next shot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I totally got that. In that scene? In that scene? In more than one scene. Several oh, scenes. Really? He would just randomly, like, turn green. It was really strange. Yeah. And I didn't know if that was just, like, my TV or... <laughs> it might just be the fact that it's an older film. Um... Could be. So, I would like to get into our four questions, if you guys are cool with that. Um, yeah. yeah. So, Dad, you've listened, you've listened to our pod. You've listened to these IMDb episodes. You know these four questions we do. Um, first, let's get into it with uh, most rewatchable scene. Um, what are, uh, uh, Jagger, I'm going to shoot it to you first. What is the most rewatchable scene here for you? Um... I would say that that car chase scene was more epic than most movies that, like, <laughs> pride themselves on their car chase. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'd say that whole sequence was pretty cool, where he's just holding the groundhog and acting like it's driving. Like, I yeah. can do anything. <laughs> and the line at the end where it crashes and Chris Elliott's like... Yeah, he might, he might have survived that, and then of course the truck explodes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Um, Dad, what about you? What are I know you you can have like two or three if you want because I know there's so much in here that you love. Um, what... um yeah, I mean, Stephen Tobolowsky, who we haven't even talked about yet, the first the first Ned Ryerson encounter, um, is amazing, and they just get better from there. Yeah. Um, He's so on point. He looks so good, too. Like, he looks so sharp in that suit and the overcoat and the hat. Like, it's very hard to pull off a hat like that. And he nails it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's great. And then I found myself when I was watching this, when he wakes up the first time and he's like, this, wait, you guys got the wrong recording. You know, he's like talking to the radio and whatnot. And he starts putting it together. And then from there when it just keeps happening um that for me uh i got so excited about it i was just like oh my gosh yes um because i i knew it was going to happen but um but experiencing it for the first time again yeah it's just exciting it's fun yeah i mean i'd have to hop on with you anything with steven tobolowski i'm all in for like the whole 
It's Ned. Ned Ryerson, Needle Does Ned, don't you remember? Come on. <laughs> it's just, it's so, he's so good. Um, and I feel like there's so many throwaway quotes in here from Bill Murray, which you were talking about, that very sarcastic, smarmy Bill Murray that we get in Ghostbusters as Peter Venkman. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like we get a lot of throwaway quotes here that like no one else but Bill Murray could deliver. Like where he's like, don't you guys have a line that an emergency line that's open for emergencies and uh, celebrities? Well, I'm both like anything <laughs> like that. Bill Murray is just like, there's no one better at that very sarcastic, smarmy, like douchebag humor. And it just really mm -hmm. works for me. Um, and uh, even like Chris Elliott, dad, we were talking about that when we, when we, we were talking about him when we watched this, that, uh, the first line in the movie um, that he has where he's like, what will you, I know you'll remember it. You're better at remembering lines where he's talking about like how, you know what I'm talking about where they're still in the studio in the beginning. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to look it up. Sorry. Yeah. All good. Um, while you look that up, I'm going to move on. Second question that we like to do who won this movie? Um, uh, Jagger, why don't you go ahead while he looks that up? I think it would be pretty safe to say that the writer for this movie is the one who won it. Mm -hmm. Um, it is Harold Ramis and Danny Rubin. Yeah, yeah. Them together created a movie that has, and though again. Not my favorite movie of all time, but if we're talking about movies that have stood the test of time and are movies that are constantly brought up today, this is totally one of those. Yeah. So those two together created a classic. So respect yeah. to that. Yeah. Dad, what about you? Who won this movie? Um, uh, I've been thinking about this all day, actually. Mm -hmm. Um... And I've got to say, it's Groundhog Day, the holiday. Yeah. It just didn't mean as much. And it means so much more now. Mm -hmm. um, also in the running was Stephen Tobolowsky. I think yeah. he's just throwing 100 um, right out of the gate. Um, and then the other one would be Danny Rubin, uh, who wrote the original story, who gets the co-writing um, credit with Harold Ramis. Uh, what a huge accomplishment um story uh, you know just like the originality of all of it um is just pretty amazing i was trying to find that quote but i did come across did come across one it actually uh it actually uh bill murray's the straight man to mrs lancaster the woman who owns the b and airbnb or airbnb the mm -hmm. bed and breakfast uh, where he says, do you ever have deja vu, Mrs. Lancaster? And she says, I don't think so, but I could check with the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, That's really good. That's really good. Yeah. For me personally, um, I I think it's Harold Ramis. Um, I think this is just another classic and very highly regarded film on such a amazing filmography from him as a writer, director, and actor. I mean, mm -hmm. writing Ghostbusters, Groundhog's Day, Caddyshack, like all three of those is outstanding. I'm not going to mention Animal House because that movie has not aged well. Um, but like just having those writing credits and then having like this directing credit and like year one with Jack Black, which is also super underrated, it's just, it's so impressive um, what he was able to do with the comedy genre. Um, but let's get into our third question. Does this movie belong on the IMDb Top 250? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. What number is it on the 250? Uh, I believe it's like 233, 232. Yeah. All right. Jared, what um, about you? Okay. I know that this is going to kind of come as a shocker because 
we could have said the same thing about um persona yeah but yes the influence that this movie had totally deserves it a spot on the 250 um i'd say yeah 100 percent Mm-hmm. yeah i'd have to agree um because of the influence and how iconic it is it deserves a spot now would it be on my personal top 250 probably not um but does it deserve a spot on this list of like the all-time iconic films a hundred percent i mean same thing that we talked about with bergman's persona like would that be on our top 250 of all time definitely not no, because we both have that rated at like two stars, I think. Does that belong in the IMDb top 250? Yes. Yes, it does. Because of how... Uh, Wait, we just... We decided no. Oh, well, I'm changing episode. my opinion. As of right now, it does. Because of the... How how much... Like, how well made of a film it is. And how influential it was to a lot of other filmmakers. Which is why I think this one belongs on here. Um... And to our final question, so this is our favorite one. Dad, uh, so one of our favorite movies together, I think it's Jagger's number 12 or 13 of all time. It's my number four of all time. I know it's one of your all-time favorites, is The Shining, um, Mm. the absolute masterclass of horror. Uh, Mm -hmm. And our favorite question to ask on here, something we do with every movie, would our main character, so in this case, Phil Connors, beat Jack Torrance in a fight? That is our question. They're going, no weapons, one-on-one, who wins? We talking, we talking, does Phil Connors know this fight's going to happen? I mean, after day one, then yeah. <laughs> yeah, for the fight's happening, it's like a... Doctor, the end of Doctor Strange, where he keeps going back to Dormammu and like wears him down. Yes. Yeah, I just think that I think Phil Connors could get could get ready for this fight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's immortal, right? Yeah, and there's no stopping him. So I think, yeah, absolutely, he could totally beat Jack Torrance. Yeah, I agree. Needle nose and... Ned with his briefcase might have a chance at Jack Torrance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he, I don't know. I, I, I love it because I totally agree. And I love it because we're finally getting into films on this list where the main character could actually beat Jack Torrance where, because we went for a while, the first, like, I don't know, eight films. Like we were like, Nope, Jack Torrance wins. This is a measly, like, damsel in distress from it happened one night or uh it's like i think the first one won because our first one was dances with wolves and we were like of yeah. course he's beating him he has the whole because they can bring in any other characters and we were like oh, he, he has the yeah. whole tribe with him man of course yeah um but then for a while i don't think we had anyone beating him we thought when we got to the iron giant which dad uh which uh, quick story time um, my dad, uh, as people know, Iron Giant's like my, I believe it's my number five or six of all time. Um, and my dad is the one who showed it to me because my mom worked nights a lot when I was younger. And so on those nights, dad would make, uh, pancake or he would make breakfast for dinner and we'd watch like the Iron Giant or Ghostbusters or Back to the Future. Um, and we thought we were going to have Jack Torrance beat with that one, but then, we had a discussion about it, and he doesn't beat Jack Torrance. Um, wow. I would love to see that fight. I know. Me too. And it's actually something that we kind of changed our answer on after we had another guest on. Because, Dad, I don't know if you know this, but so, uh, and this is an interesting piece of trivia that I like, that I learned from one of our guests that I like talking about whenever I can. Um, so Brad Bird is the director of The Iron Giant. Brad Bird has also made both Incredibles mm-hmm. movies and Ratatouille. So he just doesn't miss as far as animated films come. I think me and Jagger had a whole discussion about how he's the best animated director out there. Um, And how Iron Giant, so I believe it was his sister who was killed from gun violence. And Brad Bird wanted to make a movie about, like, the idea was what if a gun was sentient and didn't want to kill people? 
Um, and that was the whole idea behind the movie. So it's just a li nice little piece of trivia that I like sharing with everybody that comes on. Um, but I think that's all of our questions. That is our review of Groundhog Day. Um, and I we are going to get into our final, final segment today. The one that me and Jagger love doing every week because we get to talk about what we've been watching. We are going to do highs and lows. Now, Dad, you are not as much of a movie watcher as me and Jagger are. You're not checking off two, three movies every day. Um, <laughs> but I know you have watched some good stuff in the past few weeks. You, you want to talk about some of the stuff you have been watching? Yeah. I mean, Groundhog Day, obviously. Uh, I did watch The Thing um and i'd never seen the thing and i loved it um yeah. i really enjoyed it um i thought the the practical effects were amazing all of the violence happens he's such an interesting filmmaker because all of the violence and um thrills uh happen so quickly in that movie yeah oh Hey, Dad, you're... Your you're... attention. Oh, there you are. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, you were muted for a second. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, it, like, snaps your attention. Um, and I just think it's, like, so expertly done. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, and then watch Big Trouble in Little China. Um, and, man, Kurt Russell just really is going for it in that movie. Um, <laughs> love it. That's on, is that on? That's got to be on the two fifty, right? And the top two fifty. I, no. I think the thing is, I don't know about Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> okay. um, All right. Well, I'll come back on for Ghostbusters then. That's got to. That's what in the top hundred, I'm sure, right? I don't think it's in the top hundred, but I'm. I hopefully it's on there. If it's not, we do uh, film talk episodes, so we'll bring you on for one of those, and we can, that yeah. that's an episode where we can just like go more in depth into some of your favorite movies. Yeah, um great jagger why don't you go ahead what have you watched this week uh what's been good what's been bad you want to give us a little overview i'll start on the 16th at night because the last thing i talked about not high and low in the last episode was napoleon dynamite yeah which is again a masterpiece uh i logged oh hello for the 15th time so yeah finally got around to that 15 times um i rewatched pearl uh, the Ty West one, amazing, because I rewatched X earlier this month. So, came back to Pearl, and it's still great. Huge Oscar snub. I watched Castaway again, which I gave two stars and was majorly disappointed with. Um, I watched Phantasm, which mm -hmm. will get more in-depth. You guys have to listen now for our Phantasm Hooptober episode, so tune in for that. Um, I watched Pump Up the Volume, the Christian Slater movie from 1990, uh, directed by the same guy who directed Times Square. It was really good, uh, yeah. really stupid, but I had a lot of fun yeah. with it. I watched Goosebumps, the movie of it with Jack Black, and I gave yes. it that because that was a movie that I watched when it first came out so many times so i've just got a lot of nostalgia with that one and i watched creep which oh besides from mark duplass yeah besides skinnamarink and that short possibly in michigan nothing has really like scared me scared me but this really bothered me a lot um, and I was not expecting it to, because I just went on Netflix and clicked on the first horror movie to pop up. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I had never heard of, called Creep. So I was like, oh, might be okay, probably gonna be bad. And then it says Blumhouse, so my mind immediately navigates to, like, James Wan type stuff. And I'm like, oh, this is gonna suck. I was wrong. It was extraordinary. It's, it's really and good. It was terrifying. Yeah. Really upsetting. And it starts yeah. with you kind of feeling bad for him, like he's the cancer patient, he's not going to live to see his kid. And as it unravels, and I just sat down, lights off, and just watched it. And as it unravels, you feel more and more uncomfortable. 
and then by the end, it's like, um, and I'm going to go back to sort of a story here. Way back when, years back, uh, on YouTube, there was this channel that made animated horror short films, and <gasps> I watched a lot of their stuff. You watched those too? I remember watching those and not being able to sleep at night. Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of those were about stalkers like this, or it'd be yep. like a guy goes on Snapchat and accepts a friend request, and then the guy shows up at his door because of like the map thing. And this sort of brought back all of those memories in one really awful experience of a package. And for a movie under 90 minutes, within the first 10 minutes, you're already shaking. Because yeah. it, never, it never sits right with you the whole yeah. time. Something always feels off about it. So I have it at four stars. And if I wasn't so uncomfortable... I would say this is a five-star movie, but it bothered me so much that I'm mad. So I can't say it. However, it is an extraordinary film that yeah. I think everyone should go watch. Very upsetting, but God, is it good. Yeah. Um, shout out to Mark Duplass. Um, top of my list of most underrated actors working today. He gets little to no recognition um, but he is just an outstanding actor. Um, he's in one with Elizabeth Moss called The One I Love that I just recently watched that's really good. He does a lot of stuff with his brother Jay. Um, and, Dad, we need to we need to watch Creep. It's it's so good. I've seen Creep. Oh, you I, ha I didn't you. know you'd seen it. Yeah, I watched okay. it Okay, what are your thoughts? You like Creep, right? You liked it? Yeah, it's just, uh, it's one of those, you just have dread the whole time yeah um more because i knew kind of like the the gist of it but um yeah all the jump scares that aren't really jump scares but they're jump scares are really great yeah um yeah it just is like a fun yeah <laughs> i found it really fun yeah to be honest yeah yeah the, uh jagger you need to check out the league it's uh in nick kroll and mark Dupro duplass led uh comedy show um that i'm currently watching right now and it's really funny um but for me this week since our last episode i finally checked off host which is a 57 minute found footage or like one of the like filmed over the internet type um movies like filmed on a zoom call um that we got out of 2020 um which uh whoever that um what what's the uh what's the website that does the scary ratings jagger science science for scares or something science is scare yeah yeah uh they rated it well and then they changed it but they rated it the scariest movie of all time um it's and still at number one Other it is things around that have changed it's still number one okay that's good yeah host scariest scientifically the scariest movie of all time uh, that it really spooked me. Honestly, it's super well done. Um, it's only 57 minutes, so they just shoot you right into it, um, which I think is super fun. They it, it uh, doesn't really leave too much on the field is the term, but like I don't know in a movie way. Um, and then after that, I watched The Tall Man with Jessica Biel, which really sucked. I regret watching that um it just it wasn't good it was a mess tonally and a mess genre wise it couldn't decided it couldn't decide what it wanted to be or what kind of movie it wanted to be and sometimes uh when you mix genres it works this it was just a, it was a really frustrating watch because most of the time you didn't understand what was happening um i rewatched night at the museum secret of the tomb which is the third one anytime I gave that four stars. I know that's pretty lowly, low rated, but anytime I get to, s it's the same thing with like how I talk about the Hobbit or the Fantastic Beasts movies. Anytime I get to spend in this world that brings me so much joy and warmth and nostalgia is time well spent. Um, because I grew up watching Night at the Museum. I remember seeing Night at the Museum 3 in the theater. I remember seeing Night at the Museum 2 in the theater. They just bring me so much joy, and I, I just love spending time with those films. 
Um, Groundhog Day, obviously. I watched The Devil Wears Prada for the first time, which was all right. Um, so, I mean, Stanley Tucci, just unbelievable. I love Stanley Tucci so much. Um, <clears throat> I watched, so this is, so I watched the Poughkeepsie tapes, which is a movie, um, that is famous for how dark and messed up it is. Um, it, is essentially a mockumentary about a serial killer and they found all the tapes of what the serial killer did in his basement and there it's about them talking about this serial killer and there's constant tapes and i didn't give this movie a rating because of how gross it made me feel which jagger you know you know me i don't get like i don't get really like spooked no, or anything yeah. like that with horror like ever like i can handle like terrifier 2 level gore and be completely fine sleep just fine after that um this movie really messed with me i had the same feeling after i watched this that i had after i watched spotlight um just this feeling of heaviness and darkness in my heart and the, it was like i say in my review like, I couldn't give it a rating because I hated it for that. Like, I'm like, wow, why would someone make this? But I'm also like, horror is, uh, the, the meaning of horror is to look at the really dark parts of humanity in a really, like, brutal and honest way, right? That's what it means to be elevated horror, where you have, like, these deeper layered themes. Um, and, like, the sad reality of this film is serial killers are a real thing, you know? Um, and it felt, it was so well written and so well done. Most of the time I forgot it was fake. I thought I was watching a documentary and, um, this is the first horror movie I've cried, um, because of how like disturbed it left me. Um, I still haven't given it a rating. I will give it a rating at some point, but this is the first one, first movie I've ever watched that I will never recommend to anybody. Like, people will be like, should I watch this? And I'll be like, no, you shouldn't. It's it's not a good time whatsoever. Um, could, I, could I ask you a question? Yeah. Because when you, when you reviewed it, I went and read other reviews about that movie, Human Centipede 2, some, other, some more of those movies. That are, like, that on the disturbing that. movie Iceberg. Some of that lower down stuff on there. Yeah. And a lot of those movies with things that you'll have like Serbian film disgusting movies that in Gunch's words push the boundaries of what's legal yeah and a word that came up a lot in those reviews was regret like I regret watching this because it stuck with me in a bad way do you regret having watched Poughkeepsie Tapes That's a really difficult question to answer because I think it is an insanely well-made horror film, right? Like at the point of a found footage horror film is to make you feel as though it's real and to give you that illusion of it being real, right? And in that sense, it succeeded. Horror as a genre it is supposed to like make you feel as uncomfortable and scared and like there's a monster hiding in your closet it's trying to make you feel like that as much as possible. Again, in that sense, it succeeded. Did I have a good time watching this? Absolutely not. Am I glad I watched it and got to experience this master class of cinema? Yes. So I, I do regret it and I don't regret it at the same time. It's, it's, it's a very confusing feeling that I have about this film. Um, and it's something that I will probably not rate for another month. I'm going to let it sit. I'm going to let it stew. Um, and I probably won't give it a rating for another month or so. Um, but yeah, it's it was just, it was a hard watch. Um, moving on. <laughs> uh, I watched, uh, I finally got around to the 2023 release, uh, Totally Killer, which is the prime film that everybody has been raving about. Um, it was fine. It? it was... It looks like a lot of fun. Two stars. It was alright. The, uh, 
the villain's mask look just looks like Max Headroom, um, which I yeah, couldn't. That's... I couldn't stop <laughs> thinking about that the entire time. I'm like, who does that look like? That's something from the '80s. And then I was like, Max Headroom, and I'm like, holy crap, it's him. Um, <laughs> I think it's supposed to be a Max Headroom mask. Um, mm-hmm. I watched uh, the day after tomorrow with uh, Dennis Quaid and Jake Gyllenhaal. Um, four and a half stars has an overall rating of 2.9 on Letterboxd. Um, I'm a real sucker for disaster films like San Andreas 2012. Um, anything where there's like a huge environmental or end of the world incident happening, like aliens invading, like Independence Day, something like that, what that brings people together who usually wouldn't be brought together. I love it. I'm all in. And this is one of the more well done and uh, better ones I've seen in a while. And Jake Gyllenhaal's in it, so that's always good. Um, I watched The Invisible Man, which, Dad, I don't know if you've seen Elizabeth Moss. Um, and oh, yeah. uh, what? Because I know Mom Mom didn't like this. Um, and that this is the last one I'll talk about. Mom, I know Mom didn't love this, but what are your thoughts on it? Because I, I gave well, it five stars. Yeah, I, mean, I thought it was outstanding. I'm a huge Elizabeth Moss fan. Yeah. Um, really, just Mad Men. I... Um, just love her character. Um, but I'm, I'm constantly concerned about the movie roles that she takes on. It just seems like she just wants to be in distress and in pain. Um, yeah. And again, Elizabeth, if you're watching this or listening to this, come live here. You can live here. We're not scary. Um, I'm not going to chase you around the house. Um, you can just live here stress-free. Um, you don't have to put yourself through that much pain. Just come live with us. Yeah. That's my plea to Elizabeth Moss. I, I loved it. Um, I thought it was super, super, uh, Are you solid. distracted right now? No, I was trying to find, who's the guy in Beethoven? Because whenever somebody says... Charles Grodin. Charles Grodin. Whenever somebody says an actor who's distressed, my mind always oh, go to that. Oh my God. Charles Grodin in Beethoven. Beethoven! The entire movie yeah. looking like he's going to have a brain aneurysm. Um, yeah. But Invisible Man, Invisible Man, I thought really solid horror film. Um Lee Wannell, uh, who was actually uh, uh, a co-writer for the all a lot of the Saw movies, and starred alongside Carrie Ells in the first Saw movie. I don't know if you you knew that, Dad. He's the other guy in the room who directed Adam? this film. Yeah, um, really. And also directed oh. one of my favorite action sci-fi films, Upgrade. Um, his camera work is so, and his use of negative space um is just so extremely impressive um and it really showcase he really showcases it in this film um but i think that's about it thank you again dad thank you for joining us today uh everybody you can be looking forward my dad will be back on we are planning a dad's episode where jagger's dad will also come on and we will be discussing and comparing my dad's and jagger's dad's top 25 lists um, which we've already read both of them, and it should make for a really, really interesting episode. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, thank you for listening today. If you are on YouTube, please like our video, comment down below um, anything that you want to comment. We love to hear uh, hear from you guys, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, if you're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, uh subscribe please leave us a review leave us a five-star review i think we deserve it um if you want to follow me on my socials um i'm trey the film noob twitter letterbox and tiktok he is jagger film fan on letterbox jagger film reviews on tiktok and jagger the movie guy on instagram and twitch um again check out serenity and yeah. oj production on youtube check out serenity jagger's first short film um and his first credit on letterboxd um Check that out. Uh, And again, thank you for joining us today on The Average Film Enjoyer, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.